Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Oro Sports Show brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. You guys have a good week? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. And of course, uh, this is the Oro Sports Show. I'm Matt Harrelson. Always to my right, Jeremy McKenzie, Russell Parker down there on the other end. Now guys, like we talked about last week, we're fully into March Madness. Another week passed and we are into the Sweet 16 is set and how sweet it is, of course, a few upsets, as we tend to see this time of year. Uh, some teams moving on that we thought would. Unlike myself, none of my teams moved on. We're going to get into that in just a second. Uh, but I asked you guys before we started taping to pull out your brackets. We're going to go through them, figure out what kind of mistakes we made, uh, what we got right, some of us doing a lot better than, than others. Uh, but <laughs> looking at uh, – we'll start with you, Russell. Looking at your bracket, um, who do you have left that, that, that you picked? Well, I still got Kentucky, who was hanging in there, who I picked them to be the national champion at down in all of this. I got uh, three of my final four still left. UNC was the one I don't have anymore. But I still got Kentucky, Villanova, and Duke. Um, so I guess I have to replace that somehow or another. But uh, I'll tell you what, nobody has UNBC beating the Virginia. No, they don't. And, <laughs> and we'll get into that here in just a second, too. But uh, any kind of upsets? Or what about your teams? How'd you fare? Um, my ba- I'm going to tell you the truth, my bracket been busted because I had a lot of the teams that i seen will at least go to the Elite Eight or to the Sweet 16, especially with Chopper Hill being out and Virginia was a pretty upset by them being the number one seed. And uh, and I was surprised to see Duke and Kentucky still in. Yeah, and, and I was looking uh, pretty much from day one, my bracket was busted as well. And I'm, I'm looking at mine here. I actually have – None of the teams left in the South or the West bracket, so not a good week for me. Um, I will say this. Uh, Kentucky, to me, is the team that um, pretty much has a straight shot to the Final Four. they got to face Kansas State uh, tomorrow, actually tonight, later on tonight, and then uh, they'll face the winner of Loyola, Chicago, and Nevada, which, no offense to those schools, just to me are not on the same level as Kentucky. But as far as my overall bracket, um, if you paid attention last week, I had Michigan State losing to Xavier in the national championship. Both of them are gone. I look like an idiot. <laughs> Whatever. I, I, I'm not, I never said I was an expert. I'm just on a sports show. Well, I know I did have NC State winning the first two rounds, and they got out on the first round against Seton Hall. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a couple of ones that I had, I had Stephen F. Austin going two rounds. And, of course, they lost in the first round to West Virginia. I actually had them beating West Virginia and Texas Tech. Um, teams that I didn't have was Loyola Chicago who beat Miami in the first round and then beat Tennessee pretty yeah. handily was kind of yeah. surprised me um, because if you ask anybody who Loyola Chicago was if they tell you they know who they are they're lying um, <laughs> yeah. um, but the chance uh, we get the chance to do a do-over because um, I said so and my bracket's terrible uh, but Russell since yours is pretty much intact um, who would you pick to replace UNC there on there in that bracket I've actually got Gonzaga sitting there they've impressed me a little bit now I'm not usually a big basketball fan but I've been watching a lot of the March Madness and I'm becoming hooked on it now and seeing Gonzaga what they play has been really fun to watch so I've got them put in and of course Gonzaga was just in the national championship this past season mm-hmm. with almost the same team they only lost mm-hmm. just a couple of guys mm-hmm. to the NBA draft um, with that final four intact that you have uh, including that team uh, including Gonzaga who do you think will win it all now I still got Kentucky I'm, I still got a firm belief that they can make it all the way they've proven a lot of people wrong already in these first few rounds um, but I see them beating, uh, still beating Villanova. I still got the same Final Four set. Uh, only this time I think it'll be a low, lower scoring game as we get closer to it. So like a 64, 60 type of deal. Okay. What about you, Jeremy? How's yours looking after you do a redo? Um, I look still going with Russell said uh, earlier about Kentucky. Pretty much Kentucky, the way they set up their brackets, they got an easy ride to the Final Four. But yeah, still they got probably a test tonight against Kansas State. Uh, we'll see what, how the momentum will come out with the guys, John Calip- John Calipari, you know what he can do and his reputation. Those guys come in, do what they need to do. Hey, they might can beat Kansas State, even though I predict Kansas State will beat Kentucky tonight. So, <clears throat> with the redo, who do you think is going to win it all now? Because obviously Chapel Hill I, is no longer around. Yeah, my Tar Heels are so gone. <laughs> but I'll still say Kentucky is subject to go to the national championship and win it. Okay. I, I would still say Villanova is a threat, though. Um, they're playing, they've been playing stellar. They, of course, beat my Alabama Crimson Tide in the second yeah. round. They blew them out of the water. But yeah. overall, they've been playing really good. I still think they're going to be the top dog when they come into it. Mm-hmm. And everybody else that they face will be because they're a dog. I hate to say this, but I'm going to have to take Duke. 
to win it all. Right now, I don't think anybody in the country. You just saying no, no. You just say well. You just saying that because they the only North Carolina team left. Well, and <laughs> and, that may, and that's true. Because um, a lot of times it's Duke, I always pull for Duke unless Tar Heels are out, vice versa. Oh, but, ACC. But I will say this: in my original bracket, I had Michigan State beating Duke. So, right now, I, I've watched a couple games Duke's played. Um, mm-hmm. But Marvin Bagley's just killing it. The guy's unstoppable right now. Yes. Grayson Allen on the outside shooting threes. The whole team, I mean, in my opinion, they're the most talented team in the nation, yeah. um, even before the tournament started. So that's who I'm going to have. I'm going to have them facing Villanova in the Final Four, of course, beating Nova. On the other side, I've got Kentucky moving in on that top bracket. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want to go with Gonzaga, so um, I don't know. I think I might have to go with Michigan down there. I, I wasn't sold on Michigan, but they played very can, well. They shoot the three very can well. Can you see a dream match between Duke and Kentucky? Absolutely, yeah. The two of the best coaches in the um, nation. And, I mean, at this point, I think we can all agree, I, I can see Kentucky on that side getting into the national championship mm-hmm. and end up playing Duke. Um, I think at this point that's those are two of the best, at least talent-wise, yes. teams. Um, Duke filled with top freshmen. Of course, you have Grayson Allen as the anchor senior mm-hmm. there. Kentucky's the same thing, minus that senior, but uh, Kevin Knox is one mm-hmm. of the best players mm-hmm. as, a, as a freshman in the, in the country. He's really uh, come out here during the tournament and shown what he can do. Uh, now, now, talking about the uh, the brackets, uh, former President Barack Obama came out, yes, he did during his presidency and made his picks, um, so I'm going to give him a little grief in case he's watching. Uh, <laughs> he actually picked Michigan State to win it all in the men's bracket, of course, he's wrong. Um, he also chose UConn from the women's side, which that's not really a stretch. I mean, anybody that's going to put the smart money on the Lady Huskies. No. Uh, no. George H.W. Bush, George W.'s dad, uh, kind of trolled Obama on Twitter a little bit and put out his predictions. Now, he had Virginia, which, of course, we know ended up losing as the only uh, one seed to lose to a six team. So he has them, but he also has Texas A&M, Villanova, and Duke in his final four. So he's like you. He's still alive with three out of four, and he has A&M over Nova. And this was his original bracket. So just want to give a presidential shout-out to them. <laughs> now, uh, you know, we mentioned UMBC, which for Who? anybody that doesn't exactly, Who? exactly <laughs> Who is that? doesn't know where that is, that is the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, of course, uh, made history when they were the first 16 seed to upset a one seed. We all knew it was going to happen. Um, it had to, just odds wise, it had to happen eventually. And I could have even made a case that it could happen to a team like Virginia that's uh, slow paced, plays defense very well, but doesn't score a lot of points. The thing that surprised me was is how badly they beat 20 points. 20 points. I mean, what happened there? I think going down to with Virginia, I think with poor defense. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah, because yeah. Virginia, and I think to, and we got with the narrative with University of Virginia. You come in as the number one seed in the ACC. You come to also come into the the idea of pretty much to predominate predominate the uh, March Madness tournament. But I always say it's like the David and Goliath game. Sure. You can't really. You really can't really pick on little man because you know a lot of times the little man gonna beat the bigger man right and that's what um maryland did again um university of maryland and baltimore county did to virginia they came took care of business and beat the number one seed now, what do you think was this the case of virginia was just too big for their bridges so to speak well i think that they were uh they came in this game very overconfident at mm-hmm. number one overall uh they had all these accolades they were seen from this season and they're gonna play against number 16 who and then but on the other side, UMBC, when I watched that game, and they were just energetic. They didn't come in this game saying, oh, we're just happy to be here. They actually wanted to come in and play and win, and they were very, very aggressive throughout the entire game. Uh, I think overall they just they were they were there, and they wanted to be there, and they wanted to prove people that they could do this, and they certainly proved it. So I look at it from the chain reaction point of UMBC beat number one Virginia, and then loses by seven or eight to Kansas State. So is Kansas State better than Virginia? I don't think no. so. No, not on paper. But it just goes to show you the madness that comes in March. Um, that any you know any given day, any team you can get this, beat. Can, you know, depending on the matchup, can, can lose to a you know a top seed can lose to a high seed. Well, I think so. UMBC is the standard in this whole tournament that everybody who was under ranked or lower ranked should be beating the uh, rank that's higher than them. And I think also <laughs> they also sent the message to the rest of the tournament just because. We're a small school and never been known for what we do. Hey, we we come to your house and beat you. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you know, with that being said, Loyola Chicago's an 11 seed. I think they're the yeah. highest seed still yeah. left out there. 
But, I mean, at this point, they're in the Sweet 16. I mean, who says they can't get to the Final right. Four? They've got to play Nevada and then probably face Kentucky or Kansas State. I don't know that they could beat them, but I also mm-hmm. didn't know that they could beat Miami and Tennessee mm-hmm. on back-to-back days. So, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, I do know this. Warren Buffett, you can keep your billion dollars because before the Sweet 16 was even set, because of this game, there were no perfect brackets. And that's across any platform that turned, you know, where you could turn one in and it'd be on file, ESPN, Yahoo, NCAA.com. No perfect brackets left. I, I think it's think the quickest it, that's ever happened. Well, and that, I think even in the, after the first round, I believe there was like 34 left on yeah. ESPN. Yeah. And now I'm sure there's none now yeah. at all. As soon as Virginia lost, they just they threw that out the window. <laughs> uh, now, I bring up UMBC again because their head coach, Ryan Odom, is now a hot commodity, of course, with them beating Virginia. Um, now, the uh, administrators at UMBC have come out and said that they want to renegotiate his contract and give him a bigger contract within their realm. Of course, they're a smaller school. They're not going to be able, uh, be able to offer what a Power 5 school is. Just real quick, your opinion. Do you think he stays at UMBC, or do you think he waits it out for a, for a bigger school to come call him? I think he'll wait it out to, for a bigger university to call him, and I think when the money is right, I think he'll leave that leave the school and go somewhere else. I think he should stay. I mean, here, here he is with beating the number one team overall in the tournament. I mean, that that's huge on him and his accomplishments. He could probably do a whole lot more, but I think he could probably carry the UMBC team a little bit better in their conference and their league and overall get that school on the map. He could be something part of something much bigger than just his own personal gain. Personally, I would stay, but I know he'll probably go where the money is. Yeah, I could go either way with this. I understand what you're saying in that this is obviously going to help recruiting in some way or fashion. Yeah, so me. if he wanted to, he could stay and maybe try to build a foundation off of mm-hmm. this, get better players in there. But that's not going to happen. I mean, I mean, they're the first team to yeah. do something that's been impossible for a while, ever since this tournament started. Right. Yeah. you got to strike while the iron, iron's yeah. hot, so they say. And I think right now he's the hottest name going in coaching, yeah. even though there's not a whole lot of openings mm-hmm. as we speak. But if I'm him, I'm going to take advantage of this situation and try to up my contract with a Power 5 right. or maybe a mid-major school yeah. or try to make you know a couple million a year or whatever the, the going is for teams like that. Now – uh, as we do every week, we always make a prediction. Last week, we made an NBA prediction, which we're going to get to later on. Stop laughing. Uh, but he's undefeated still. But uh, we're going to go back to college basketball for this week uh, for our prediction. Now, number five, Clemson, is going to be facing number one, Kansas, tomorrow night. Um, so I want to get you guys' prediction. Here you got Tigers or Jayhawks? I'm going for the Jayhawks. All right. Gonna go I'm going to have to go with Jayhawks, too. All right, well, good. I'm going Clemson Tigers. I think they have a, I think they have, I think they have a legit shot at beating Kansas. I know Kansas is always there. They're one of the top teams. For some reason, they don't always deliver in March, though. I don't know why. I mean, it's been a, a few years since they've won a national yeah. championship. Matter of fact, I think it's been 10 years. Yeah, since uh, pretty much the first year when Roy Williams left, go Chopper Hill. I don't know if it's been that long. I think Bill Self might Bill have Bill Self, one. yeah, he got a couple of them. Yeah, you're I right. I think he's got yeah. one. But yeah. nonetheless, it's been well, this, a while for them. I don't know if this March Madness has just been what it is. It's been predi- so unpredictable. Yeah, I mean, it could go either way, obviously. Yes. It's 50-50 shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, the Tigers are playing just exceptionally well. Like I said last week, they've got some big men. They can move up and down the court, get rebounds. Um, they're, they're a lot quicker than people realize. And, you know, when they lost Grantham, their, their point guard, I, I've said this before, but I thought that was it for them. They're out. But uh, – here, here they are in the Sweet 16 and getting ready to face the Jayhawks. So we got Clemson Tigers, Kansas Jayhawks, and Jayhawks down there on the end. So we will have to wait and see next week, see how right we are. And, of course, when we come back uh, next week's show, we will be down to the Final Four. So we'll have to come back and see how uh, wrong or right we were from our uh, redos here and see who's going to be fighting for the national championship in New Orleans. Or is that actually San Antonio, isn't it? Yes. I'm getting my WrestleMania and Final Four mixed <laughs> up. Uh, but when we return from the RS Sports Show, we're going to talk some NFL. Of course, free agency is still in full swing. We're in the second week now. Uh, going to look at uh, who's doing what's right, who's doing what's wrong, and uh, see who's going to be the team to beat when we get into the 2018 NFL season. So all that and more when we come back from the RS Sports Show, brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. At Richmond Community College, we can prepare you for a high-skill, high-paying career in a variety of fields. From business to education, engineering, utilities, healthcare, criminal justice, information technology, and human services. At Richmond Community College, we can save you thousands of dollars on tuition through our university transfer programs that provide a seamless transition to universities and colleges throughout North Carolina. At Richmond Community College, we are always developing new courses and programs in response to the communities we serve. We offer day, evening, and online courses, and you can now complete five curriculum programs entirely online. 
At Richmond Community College, we believe in helping you prepare for a better life. Richmond Community College, local college, big impact. Exit Realty Platinum in Rockingham has listed one of the most beautiful homes in Richmond County. Located in Rockingham on Ledbetter Lake, the home features four bedrooms with bamboo floors and a kitchen featuring stainless steel appliances and granite countertops and a master bedroom that overlooks Ledbetter Lake along with a spacious tile shower and the attached master bathroom. The open living space leads to the back deck with a perfect view of Ledbetter Lake and the property features its own boat dock. Want to see this beautiful home? Call Nicole Hayden with Exit Realty Platinum. Your source for homes in Richmond and Moore counties. And welcome back to the RO Sports Show brought to you of course by First Health Orthopedics. Now as I said before the break guys we're going to get into some NFL free agency. We're now the second full week into it. Last week there was a ton to talk about because it seemed like everybody uh, in the world in the NFL was making moves. Of course it slowed down as you would expect it would but there's still some things to talk about so let's get right into it. Jeremy you're the man on this one. Um, and, and free agency for the second week we see that um the Los Angeles Chargers did pick up Mount Pouncey for a two-year, $15 million deal. Um, that was solidified off the line with Russell Kuhn. Now you got Pouncey, so you pretty much will have Phillip Rivers having this off the line, so he can pretty much can play for two, three more years. Um, also, we have Tyron Matthew. Much Everybody know him as Honey Badger signed with the Houston Texans for a one-year, $7 million deal. I'm going to truly say Houston pretty much got a steal out of this one, especially with Javion Clowney, J.J. Watt, Jonathan Joseph, and Kareem Jackson. You pretty much pretty much going to pretty much have a a top five defense. So we'll see what Houston can do with Deshaun Watson coming back from ACL surgery. And um, they pretty much can be dangerous. Um, we also, Carolina, my team, we picked up Jerry's right on yesterday to solidify the slot receiver position. Uh, hopefully he'll compete with uh, Curtis Samuel and Damian Burr for that position. Um, Andy picked up former Chapel Hill Tar Heel tight end uh, Eric Ebron for a two-year $15 million deal. Uh, Orlando Sandrick, I'm sorry, Cowboys, he's going to the rival to the Washington Redskins. <laughs> he'll, he'll pair up with Josh Norman. We'll see that will happen for two games out the season. <laughs> And um, New England also made a trade with uh, former Oakland Raiders uh, wide receiver return specialist Cordell Patterson. And um, LeGarrette Blunt coming off a Super Bowl winning team, going to the Detroit Lions. Uh, Michael Crabtree come, leaving Oakland to go to Baltimore. And uh, Sheldon Richardson leaving uh, Seattle, going to Minnesota. Um, and then we lost, Carolina lost um, Ed Dickerson. Uh, to the Seattle Seahawks to a three-year deal. So not as many bigger names yeah. as we saw last week, but still a lot of movement going on. Um, one deal that I wanted to highlight with you guys was the Jets this week traded up uh, with the Indianapolis Colts. The Jets now have the number three pick. The Colts will move back to where the Jets were at six. Um, for some reason, the Jets gave up uh, three draft picks, two second-rounders this year and a second-rounder next, next year just to move up three spots. Kind of reminds me last year when the Bears did the same thing and ended up taking Mitchell Trubisky from Carolina. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. Do you think this was a good trade for the Jets, good trade for the Colts? Um, and who do you see each team taking now that all this is shaking out? Well, with this, with the pick with New York Jets, you know, they got so many, they got so many holes to fill, especially with the quarterback position, especially we got Josh McCall, who's 39 years old, pretty much not a long-term guy. You want to see behind center. And they bring in Teddy Bridgewater for as a free agency pickup to back him up. Um, I got, and you got Christian Mecklenburger and um, Brett Bryce Petty, who did play a little bit on last year. I, it could go either way with New York Jets. Pretty much with you could draft a running back, they could draft a quarterback, and also if they want to decide to go to the defense or they can uh, stay at offense and draft offensive line for the future. But I think the Colts really took a loss at this one because you traded away a lot of picks to get to New York to get them an advantage. With the, the Colts with the number six pick, hey, you can go out and get Andrew Luck a, uh, a top flight receiver, office alignment. Even you can go to the defense because they have so many holes to fill. Right, right. What do you think, Russ? I would say with having a higher pick, that gives you more options to choose what you really need. And I think it's a good idea to have – 
the short term fix that could help the long term. So mm-hmm. I'll give credit that I think the Jets made a good uh, mm-hmm. option there. I'm going to go the other way with it. You just said that the Jets have a lot of positions to fill, yes. and they do. So why give up the pick you already have plus three other ones in the future to get one pick when you have so many different mm-hmm. positions that you need to fill? And I understand. I get what you're saying. It gives you more options from the players available. The Jets more than likely are going to take a quarterback with this pick. Now, I don't know who it's going to be, whether it's Darnold or Rosen or Josh Allen or whoever. I uh, think I, I really believe if it come down, if I was pretty much with New York Jets with the GM, uh, that I pretty much would take Sam Darnold from you at Southern California. If he's there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the thing. they could pull off a lot of wide receivers too in the next yeah. couple of rounds. And yeah. The first round – it's not all of the best players. You got second and third round except some really great players you can pull out there as well. Yeah. So I think just losing a few <laughs> first rounds in the future is not going to hurt them as bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, but that's kind of my point, though. Those second rounders that they gave up could have been hidden gems that you now have no shot at getting. Mm-hmm. Um, so just in my opinion, I would say it's uh, not so good of a trade for the Jets simply because you only moved up three spots. I mean, yeah. how much closer to the, the guy you want are you getting? Um, for the Colts, though, I think it's a good move because not only do you get those draft picks back, but you, like I said, you only move back six spots. Most people, they have, they already have Andrew Luck, so they have a quarterback. They're set there. Most people have them, when they were at three, taking Bradley Chubb from NC State, the defensive end. You know, and at six, maybe do they get a shot at him? I don't know. I think Mika Fitzpatrick, the uh, corner from Alabama, will probably be there. Um, there's usually a guy or two from Ohio State on defense that moves up. Um, they could end up getting one of those guys. I can see the Colts taking uh, defense with, at the sixth pick. I might have me a new uh, football team to pull for next year if Minka goes there. <laughs> yeah. No, and nothing we may can do it one of these days and do a mock draft. Oh, we will. Oh, we will. I just oh, hope yeah. it goes better than my than my college basketball bracket. But, uh, um, but also, and then you take with the Jets, you know. So, I mean, you know, you had Matt Forte just retired from the league. Um, they can go out to um, – if he's still on the board, you can go out to Ridley from Penn State or – Hey, yeah. Oh, that's the great thing about the draft is the the options are limitless yeah. Yeah. until the guys in front of you start getting drafted. Yeah. So, and then you have to make some decisions. Um, now that we're the second weekend, I know we did this last week, but I want to get your guys' take on uh, who you think is doing the best so far, uh, free agency wise, and who you think's not doing so well. We'll start with you, Russell. Uh, I guess I might go with the Jaguars here. I think they got a good shot now with the AC, AFC Championship with some of their draft, some of their change ups, maybe. All right, and who do you think is not doing so hot? Uh, not really sure on that one there. Well, you know, Houston, I mean, well, Jacksonville's not doing too well right now. They just released Alan Hearns and got rid of their all-time, the all-time tight end in Mercedes Lewis. So, yeah, just, yeah Mercedes Lewis was still there. Yes, he. I remember when he first got drafted <laughs> when he was playing for uh, UCLA. I, say, I think I was in college when he got drafted. But um, it's just like <laughs> Russell said, I think, uh, well, Jacksonville's taking a lot of hits pretty much, you know, f- offensively, but defense, ain't, you know, they still good. They can pick up a lot of people. You know, Jacksonville can get – can replace those guys in the draft. Yeah. For, but options get Blake Border more weapons. But um it, I, I think Jacksonville's on the rise here a little yeah. bit. Especially after this year looking to make a, a uh. statement to the NFL. I think they got a chance to mm-hmm. make it somewhere big in the next five years. And, you know, they, they let Hearns go. Yeah. But I can absolutely see in them because of the good year they had last year, they're kind of higher up in the draft order. I can see them taking uh, James Washington, the wide receiver from Oklahoma State, or another Calvin Ridley, like you mentioned there, to yeah. kind of replace Hearns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and because you got to find somebody that could, you know, take over for Allen um, Robinson, yeah. sign with the Bears. Oh, he did, so they lost two receivers. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh. But then it's time to draft the receiver, Jacksonville, if you're listening out there. Uh, but uh, who you got winning the free agency so far? Um, as this for this, I'm going for the second week still. I think uh, Houston picked up Honey Badger was a steal. Yeah. Um, even though he was red hot, probably the, one of the best safeties on the market at that time. Um, you pair him up with J.J. Wide and um, Javion Clowney, you pretty much have a big three. On defense, oh yeah, it can probably make a lot of noise in AFC, AFC South, and probably can pretty much can make a lot of noise in AFC. So, Jacksonville ain't too far from behind New England, would not have you. But the question is, can Houston stay healthy for the whole full sixteen game season? And if they can, Houston can be on the rise. Absolutely. And um, I think the loss, um, and then the loss for the week. I think to a degree, I think Detroit's taking a step back. Because you're looking at, 
you know, you got to get Matthew Stafford some weapons a little bit. Uh, LeGarrette Blunt, you brought him in pretty much a one-year deal to pretty much solidify the third down back. But I think they could pretty much, consign, you know, draft one for the future to complement Blunt. But then you bring in – then pretty much you lost your top tight end in Eric Ebron, so – I think Houston's pretty much going to, pretty much going to. So Detroit's got some work to do. You got some work to do, pretty much. I'm going to uh, agree with you that right now Houston's in the driver's seat. Picking up uh, Honey Badger is just. First of all, I'm really surprised the Cardinals let him get away like yeah. that for nothing. Yeah. I mean, this is one, in my opinion, one of the top. Safety. One, yeah, one of the top defensive backs in in the league. Uh, I know Patrick Peterson's going to be missing him next year. I know it. Uh, so I'm going to go with them. Um, as far as uh, losing out right now, I'm going to go with the Buffalo Bills because as teams have been rotating and looking for quarterbacks, it's obviously a quarterback-starved league. Mm. They lost Tyrod Taylor in that trade to Cleveland. Of course, yeah. Tyrod's going to be a Brown next year. Tyrod helped take them, along with Shady McCoy, helped take them to the uh, to the playoffs last year for the first year, what you say, 18 years? Since 99. Yeah which is too long, and I hope they enjoyed it because I don't think they're going to get back. <laughs> uh, Nate Peterman, who we saw come in for a game last year and threw like seven interceptions in one game, which I don't even know how you let a guy stay in that long. He's going to be backing up A.J. McCarron, who has been the backup for Andy Dalton in Cincinnati. No offense to you, but I've never been real impressed with Alabama quarterbacks in the NFL. And, and he, yeah, you got a point there. And he falls Over. in line with that. I don't think that he's going to be able to, um, to to get the Bills back to the playoffs again, even with Shady back there and even with a, a very much improved defense. Um, now, I do want to bring this up, talking about quarterbacks. It was reported that Colin Kaepernick is still working out on his QB skills. Um, obviously, the guy wants to be back in the NFL. Um, do you see him as being a starting quarterback next year or maybe just a quarterback in general? I believe that, you know, Colin Kaepernick, you know, 32 teams in the NFL, all anybody can look for a quarterback. If somebody looking for a quarterback, I hope Buffalo Bills need to be getting on the phone calling this man because yeah. <laughs> you're not you're not looking too good on the quarterback uh, quarterback committee. You got an unproven quarterback in AJ McCarron, even though he uh, I love Alabama and I remember him playing in that national championship and won it. And um, then Nate Peterson, like you said, those seven picks in one game. I don't know why he's, he's still on the roster, but um, if you really need a veteran presence. In the locker room and a leader, you whoever the owner of the Buffalo Bills, you need to give him a phone call. Absolutely. What do you think, Russell? I think I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think AJ McCarron in a good spot at Buffalo Bills, a chance to prove himself, sure, and to get the opportunity that's going to help him out. So I don't, I don't really think now looking at it from the Bills' perspective overall, the GM, I think I would want someone like Colin Kaepernick. You want the best on your team, somebody's yeah. already proven. If, if it comes down to two of them, I think they would take Colin. Um, but, yeah, I think that's what that would happen if they were to. I would like to see Colin Kaepernick as a not only a quarterback but a starting quarterback just because there are some teams out there that, let's face it, their quarterbacks are not better than Kaepernick. No. And you can just – I have to do is look at the stats. I mean, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a race issue. It's not a black-white thing. It's a whose quarterback is better. And a lot of times Kaepernick is the better of whoever your quarterback is. Yeah. Um, Took the guys to the Super Bowl and pretty much in this last year with San Francisco had a higher passer rating than any other quarterback. Absolutely. And it may be controversial, but, you know, the whole thing with him taking the knee and all that, Yeah, I'm not going to – I mean, I'll just flat out say it. I think that uh, it was really in poor taste how the NFL owners pretty much colluded what it seems like to keep this guy out of the league. I mean, look at last year when Aaron Rodgers went down. They didn't even look at Colin Kaepernick. When other quarterbacks that were their stars mm -hmm. went down – and uh, when Deshaun Watson went down, they didn't look at Colin Kaepernick. And uh, Seattle, and I remember when uh, Russell Wilson had went down for a few games. Yeah. And um, Seattle did contact him behind that, but they went another way. But mm -hmm. I just feel like, to me, with the whole situation, it's like, are we? T you know, it seems like we've we been punished for doing what's right, and it's killing our careers. My whole point is, is that taking a knee, you know, protesting police brutality, oh, whatever. There are some people that will say that that should not be, you know, he shouldn't be protesting on yeah. the field. Well, let's face it, this guy was doing it in the locker room. Nobody would know about it. We wouldn't yeah. be talking about it first of all. Yeah. But um, I know he brought it into the stadium. But one thing, in my opinion, shouldn't have to do with the other. Because the yeah. guy is it's an activist shouldn't mean that all of a sudden now he's not a good enough quarterback to play for right. the for the yeah, Browns. Are you kidding me? Like, come on. Yeah, because look at – because my – you know, all the way to the outside – outside interference, what he has done, but the man can still play. You know, like I say, he took those guys to a Super Bowl. Yeah. And – Not it, that long ago. Either. Yeah, not that long. And 
even made San Francisco what it was, you know, at the time, even with the strong fan base, you know, getting out there, he, it's mobile, can throw a good deep ball, you know. Now, you mentioned Buffalo. Is there any place you could see Kaepernick maybe jumping on, even in a backup situation? Yeah, I think there's a lot of places he can go to a backup. Back up. Uh, I mean, he could, he could go to Arizona. Look, you know, look at Sam Bradford's situation. Yeah. It and going on, you could, you could, I could see Colin Kaepernick in Arizona, pair him up with Air, you know, with David Johnson at the running back position, and Larry Fitzgerald having a farewell season. What, can, what better you can get with that? Yeah, mm. and, and you were probably going to say that there's a lot of, there's a lot of places that uh, you know he could end up being not only in a starting capacity but in a a, a backup capacity, um, like the. Well, first of all, the Jets could use him. The Giants, mm-hmm. he could back up Eli because oh, yeah. Eli got benched last year. Um, I mean, he could go to Washington for all we know because you don't know. You know, Alex Smith's getting up there. You don't know mm-hmm. what you're going to get with him. But so. I, I still haven't. I still with the Kyle Kaepernick. I still haven't given up hope where he will be signed. Yeah, and I agree. And hopefully that'll work out. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, a lot of times politics and sports yeah. mix, and this yeah. is just yeah. a fine example yeah. of that. Uh, now. Something uh, that uh, some people would say is just as controversial in the NFL is the catch rule. And we're not talking about fair catches like we were last week. With the NCAA. We're talking about a receiver or a running back or whoever it is comes down with the ball. There's, you know, there, for every catch, there's a thousand opinions on was it a catch? Is it not a catch? We just saw it in the Super Bowl this past year with Zach Ertz tied in, called a pass, uh, lunged across the goal line. When he came down, the ball kind of jiggled out a little bit. Uh, they did the right thing. They called that one a touchdown, which I thought it was. We've yeah, seen other was. cases where that's happened, and they've overturned it. Now, the NFL uh, executive vice president of football operations, Troy Vincent, said on Tuesday that the league is closing in on clarifying this controversial catch rule. Now, it's kind of confusing, but I'm going to try to break it down. What they say is they're going to eliminate two factors that can cause incompletions. Slight movement of the ball, like we were talking about. If you catch it, it bobbles a little bit during that motion. That doesn't matter anymore. And when you're going to the ground, they're going to eliminate that part of it. So basically, as long as you have the ball in your possession, it can be juggled a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as, as long as the ball doesn't obviously come out, um, that, then it's going to be a catch. And I think what they're trying to do is just do away with all this uh, nitpicking yeah. and just make it simple. So I Russell, think as think? long as you've got two hands on it or just even just one, if you got it, that's, yeah, that's a catch. Right. Even, even agreeing with Russell, as long as, you know, have full possession of the ball, and you know, even if you going down to the ground or you standing and making, you know, it bobbles while you try to hold, try to hold it. As long as you in bounds and have full possession, that ought to be a catch. So I looking at with that rule, that's going to be a like you said, it's going to be a controversial thing. But mm-hmm. I think as time progresses, that's going to be overturned. I remember watching um, a list that had all of like the last controversial uh, catches from the last few years. Mm-hmm. Calvin Johnson was one of them. And this guy, you remember how big Calvin Johnson is? Yeah, Megatron. Big guy. Goes up, catches it, comes down with one hand. Mm-hmm. He comes down in the end zone, and he kind of catch, balances himself with the football on the ground. Of course, it, it moves, and they didn't call it a touchdown. I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense because right. in my book – it doesn't matter what happens after the ball punches the goal line, right. especially if you're running it in after you've caught it. That very first sliver of white mm-hmm. of the goal line, once the, the nose of the ball touches that, to me that's a touchdown. It doesn't exactly. matter whether he bobbles it or takes it and kicks it into the stands or whatever. <laughs> to me that's a catch, and hopefully this rule is going to uh, simplify a lot of that that comes with it. And, of course, uh, unfortunately we do have to mention this. Um, New Orleans Saints and New Orleans Pelicans owner Tom Benson passed away last week at the age of 90. He was the Pelicans owner from 2012 to 2018 and was the Saints owner from 1985 until uh, last week. So uh, kind of one of the things I remember about him real quick was, uh, you know, when Hurricane Katrina came through in 06, he was uh, very adamant about we're going to build things back, we're going to keep the Saints here, we're not going to move, you know, because the Superdome was a mess at that point. They were very resilient and brought the Saints back, and at that time was just great for the city because it was a reason to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. As far as basketball, he decided to name them the Pelicans, which gave us back the Hornets. So I'm always happy for that because I hated being the Bobcats. I thought that was just silly. I kind of liked the Bobcats, but I wasn't around when they did that Hornet, so I wouldn't I remember when they first formed the team. Yeah, and see, I don't know if you guys know this, but the reason they were called the Bobcats was at the time BET owner Bob Johnson owned them. And yeah. he named them after himself, oh. the Bobcats. Oh, yeah, I don't like that too much. Yeah. Uh, so it was, I'm just really glad that uh, Tom was able to pass along. Yeah, he even won a Super Bowl. Pass along. Yeah, he won a Super Bowl, absolutely. So 
Uh, condolences, of course, to the Benson family and, of course, the Pelicans and Saints families as well. But uh, when we come back, we've got a lot more to talk about. NASCAR, and you took a trip to the North Carolina Museum of History. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, and there's some NASCAR mixed in there as well. We've got a lot more to talk about, including our big impact of the week, and, of course, love it or hate it. All of that and more when we come right back with the RO Sports Show, brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. McNair Auto Sales is the place to buy your pre-owned car, truck, or van. To be the best, it takes big selection, friendly staff, and great pricing. We guarantee a no-hassle buying experience, and financing is available right on site. So come see us today. We're located at 1026 East Broad Avenue in Rockingham. And remember, with over 40 years of experience, you know McNair is the name you can trust. Family Pharmacy is a local pharmacy that's been in business in Rockingham for over 10 years. Located in the Food Lion Shopping Center on US 1 North, we have easy access into the store and a drive through for your convenience as well. You can download the official Family Pharmacy app at MyFamilyPharmacy.com and we'll help you set it up to text you when your prescription is ready and you can even set it up to fill your prescriptions when due. Our motto is we'll treat you like family and it's something we truly mean. We take the same care in filling your prescription that we would take for our own family. Family Pharmacy, we'll treat you like family. Welcome back to the RO Sports Show, of course, brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. Now, the NBA season, guys, is uh, getting towards the end. We've only got just a handful of games left, so I wanted to take a minute and look at the uh, playoff positionings uh, for the NBA. But, of course, before we do that, our predictions that I uh, alluded to earlier that we made last week was uh, Monday night's game between the Golden State Warriors and the San Antonio Spurs. Russell, you and I, we could have sworn that the, the Warriors were going to walk away as victorious in this one, but <laughs> Jeremy, once again, staying undefeated, took the Spurs, and of course the Spurs won. Now, I don't know if you realize this, I did not, that the uh, Warriors were without Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, and Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I'd have known that, maybe I might have made a different prediction. Well, I could against them last week just so we I could actually beat I did too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we basically just went against you just to do it. So. Yeah. Uh, but it backfired on us, and you're still yeah, undefeated. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I trust my team. I trust my team. <laughs> yeah, as you should. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, we'll go ahead and talk about this. Since we, we mentioned last week that there was a chance the Spurs might miss the playoffs. As of right now, I've got the uh, the rankings pulled up, and if the playoffs started right now, um, here, here's how it would finish. Um, just uh, as a just kind of the, the one through eight, it would be Houston one, Golden State two. There's only there's a four game difference between them, so Houston's kind of just run away with this. Yeah. Trailblazers three. Remember I told you Trailblazers are up there. I still try to figure out how in the world you don't hear too much from them. I know. <laughs> it's because they're important. Uh, the Thunder are in the fourth spot. The Pelicans in the fifth. The Spurs are now in the sixth spot, tied with the Pelicans. Uh, T-Wolves in the seventh spot, and the Jazz are two games ahead of the Nuggets for the eighth spot. So right now, uh, just starting with the Spurs, if they played right now, they would have to travel to Portland. Now, Damian Lillard's the hottest player on the planet. You think they got a shot against them? Yes. Now, Kawhi's supposed to come back, right? Yes. Is that the reason? <laughs> well, I'm looking at – you're looking at our um, – you're looking at Portland versus San Antonio – San Antonio been there before, has got a job done with, you know, regardless who's on the roster. You look at Damian Lillard, probably the highest point guard in the league right now. Could be possibly be an MVP candidate down the road. Yeah. Um, this I look at this going to be a game seven series. If it come push, kind of shove. Because I look at the San Antonio Spurs' experience, championship quality. I believe San Antonio would, could be Portland in the first round. Now, I'm looking at it. The Thunder are 43 and 30. They're in the four spot. The Jazz are 40 and 31 in the eight spot. So there's literally one game between fourth and eighth. So we could come back next week and this thing just be all oh, jumbled the Thunder, up. Oh, the Thunder would beat the Jazz with no problem. That'd be a sweep. <laughs> well, they wouldn't play the Jazz to begin with, but um, you would think so because, uh, as a matter of fact, I give props to the Jazz because they lost Gordon Hayward to the Celtics and still are right there yeah. in the playoffs. Um, as we sit right now. Now, the uh, the Nuggets, the Clippers are right there behind them. After that, you can pretty much count out, like, the Kings, the Lakers. They're already too yeah. far behind. Um, Rockets and Warriors, though. I mean, is there anybody else in the West that's got a chance at beating them? Um, really, right now, if push comes to shove, I'll look at the Thunder. Thunder is a dark horse. You're looking at your big three with Melo, PG, and Russell Westbrook, another hot point guard on the rise. I think the Thunder can give those two teams a run for their money. You know, it's amazing how far ahead the Rockets and the Warriors are. 
Um, there's actually four games that the Warriors are behind the Rockets, but the Trailblazers are 13 games behind the Warriors, so 17 games behind the Rockets. So it shows you the dominance that the Rockets and the Warriors – of course, we knew the Warriors were going to be there. The uh, Rockets added Chris Paul, just made them that much better with the beard there. Uh, now, moving over to the, to the East, um, the Cavs right now – are in the third spot. They're 41 and 29. They're six games behind the Celtics for that last spot. Do you think they can come back against them and end up in the two spot, or do you think they're stuck in the three? I think Cleveland can do it. Yeah, I, I believe Cleveland can do it. Absolutely, they can. I think what, what they're going to run into is uh, they're going to run out of time. Is what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, because they're five and five in their last ten, which the Celtics are six and four in their last ten. But if you keep that up, you're never going to catch them. You got to go on a winning streak. The team that's surprising me is the Toronto Raptors. They are 53 and 18, or 9 and 1 in their last team, and have a firm grasp on first place in the East. They're five games ahead of the Celtics. Is this the year the Cavs don't make the, the the East championship? I mean, what do you think? Well, I think when you get to the playoffs, you know, stats won't even matter. Stand is all of that don't matter. Who can bring it to the court and can beat and can dominate in a game seven series? Yeah. Because you look at the history of Toronto. Toronto always been pretty much co- uh, competitive. Now they are probably one of the youngest, hottest teams in the Eastern Conference with DeMar Rosie. If where that for, for see where they got looking at, I can look at the fact I can't pronounce the name, but young team, energetic. Um, we probably can give Boston and Cleveland run for their money, but push comes. I can actually can see Toronto in the Eastern Conference Finals. I can actually can see it. What do you think? You think it's it for the Cavs this year? Nah, Cavs will make it all the way. Yeah. I think they can go all the way to the finals and maybe even win this thing. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of like the Warriors every year. The Cavs just kind of coast through the year. Playoff time, they turn it on. I think the difference this year is I don't think anybody anticipating the Raptors to be this good. Uh, I think everybody expected the Celtics to be there with Kyrie, but um, – I don't know that the Cavs expected to be only 41-29 and 29 and stuck in third place with the Pacers, of all people, only one game behind them. Which, by the way, shout-out to the Pacers and Victor Oladipo. Who would have thought after letting Paul George go, they'd be even better? I know I didn't see that yeah, coming. And, I, and I, one, of the, one, of the low, the, one of the teams I had to get Kato's to this year, which has been a long time coming, is the Philadelphia 76ers. And I'm glad you brought that up because if the playoffs started right now, guess who the Heat or the uh, the Celtic? Excuse me, hello, the uh, Cavaliers play in the first round. Philly. It's going to be Philly. So I think that'll be an interesting matchup because, as I've said, I think he's going to end up in Philly before this is all said and done. Does Philly give him any kind of grief, or is it a straight sweep? Straight sweep. I'm going to go with that. Wow, that bold, huh? <laughs> okay, and it's good, and it's always good to see Miami back in the playoffs, especially with Dwayne yes. Dwayne Wade coming back from that trade from Cleveland. And uh, Milwaukee, which we pretty much thought that when Jason Kidd was let go early in the year, that that was going to be it for Milwaukee. But it, it, it really, it really, in the way, it has not. That Milwaukee's still playing. And if, do, if 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 it's if it plays out like it looks right now, and again, there's only like three games separating four and eight mm-hmm. in the East, so a lot of a lot of to, left to be said yeah. about how this is going to flip. Um, after the Bucks, the Pistons are six games behind. So I think the eight teams you got now, in some form or fashion, are going to be your eight from the East. I'm going to be bold though. The Bucks would play the Raptors right now. I don't think the Bucks would upset them, but with Giannis Antetokounmpo on their team, who is basically like the future of the NBA, in my opinion, mm-hmm. they do it all. Six foot eleven guy that can shoot threes and assist and dribble and everything. Mm-hmm. I can see that one going the distance as well. I like, think he's going to give the Raptors trouble. Like, like you can see them going game six, game seven at the most. Absolutely, I could. Um, and, I mean, I don't know that I want to go all the way and say that they're going to upset Toronto, but I think that's one that could hey, definitely go the distance. You, you know what? Anything you can get beat at an even given day. Absolutely, as we see in the college ranks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, one other quick thing about the NBA, and I know we kind of touched on it here a minute ago, but the Cavs, uh, Cavs coach Ty Lue has stepped back a little bit. He's been having some health issues. He's missed some games. I think this is the third – uh, time that he's had to take some time off. Um, it seems to me like we're all thinking the same thing. But Russell, is this going to impact the Cavs at all? I really don't think so. I think the Cavaliers can just they can figure out this stuff. They can get through it, and they'll be fine. Yeah. What do you think? I believe this. Um, Cleveland know what they've been doing for the past few games. Um, even with Tyron Lou, uh, my prayers and thoughts goes out to him, and hopefully he'll be recovering. Um, Cleveland can keep the momentum going. Whoever's the whoever's the interim coach there, um, I know LeBron. He'll take full charge as a general, and they lead him to the playoffs. That's what I was gonna say. I don't think it's gonna have any bearing on it. Even if Ty Lue doesn't come back, 
You know who's going to be the coach is LeBron. LeBron. He's going to be the step-in coach because he almost coaches the team now. Yeah. I mean, any decision that's made with Cleveland, who the coach is, who they trade for, who they sign, it all goes through LeBron. Mm -hmm. So he's the owner, GM, coach. And all that stuff. He's like another Michael Jordan of the today's NBA. He's the player coach. I mean, he might as well be. I mean, yeah. He's in that capacity now. Um, but switching gears, like I usually say, uh, literally and figuratively, we're going to get into NASCAR. Uh, so, Russell, uh, where are we at this week in the circuit? Well, we were at Auto Club Speedway in Fontana, California, and Martin Truex Jr. won that. And a really good, a good solid finish. Uh, he won the first two stages and then won the race. So he swept all three stages of the race. Um now leads the point standings over a lot of the guys like Logano, who was running up top, uh, Kevin Harvick, uh, who's no longer at the top anymore, but um, still a threat to the whole championship run overall. Um, Kyle Larson finished second, who was actually uh, – Kyle Busch finished third, who was my pick to win it last week. Um, and Brad Kozlowski finished fourth, Logano rounded out the top five. And, um, yeah, Harvick at that point had won, what, three races in a row? Oh, yeah. So Truex put a stop to that. And he, um, well, it wasn't really Truex who put a stop to it. It was actually Harvick who did it. He, uh, Him and Kyle Larson had a like a little bout on the backstretch of the uh, racetrack. Uh, I think Kyle Larson had passed him. And then when they came back around again, Harvick tried to wreck Larson. Or he, he claimed that something happened with his car or whatever, but it, and it resulted with Harvick crashing out of the race. Now, you mentioned that, and I want to ask you your opinion on this. Is it Does it seem like there's more of that infighting in the NASCAR now, or has that always been there we just pay more attention to it now? Well, the very first televised race of NASCAR ended with a fight on the track. Uh, so I would say it's always been there. It's always a kind of a boys have ad type of deal, but recently they've kind of been penalizing drivers for getting into fights uh, or anything like that. Probably because now it hurts the sport right. as the face of it, it will. So there's probably a reason why they do that more or less, but I, I think it's about the same as it's always been. Yeah, I would imagine that it's always been there, and I can see you know some of the older guys getting into it, just I, not with as many cameras around. Yeah, and I think now with social media, they've been taking it to there. You saw like Kyle Busch will say something about being salty on there, right? Or uh, Denny Hamlin go there to talk about something because the media he thinks the media is twisting something, or I just throw names out there, but um, you know, social now, media has elevated it. Now, if these guys go on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and and talk smack about the other guys, do they get fined for that, or, or does NASCAR just kind of just let it go away? Yeah, it's kind of let that go away. I'm assuming if they say something controversial, they'll probably find on them, but usually they don't care much about the talking part of it, as long as you're not running NASCAR's name into the ground. But uh, even like Brad Keselowski, who has said some things about Toyota uh, last year, he, I don't think he got fined. He might have had a talk, but he didn't get fined or anything. Um, yeah, talking, not done so much, but when they, when they throw fists, they want their fines. Now, now be honest. Even though these guys get fined, do you really think it's better or or worse for NASCAR when these guys actually get out and try to fight each other? Because people love that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. It draws <laughs> in the crowd, and people a lot of people actually miss that. Um, a few years ago, when Brad Keselowski had gotten into a fight with uh, Matt Kenseth at Charlotte, uh, and it was like a kind of like an elimination style race there because it was in the playoffs. Um, why everybody just loved that? I had a friend who was there, and he was uh, he's seen that happen on pit road. It was just crazy, and a lot of these drivers have made their names through just fighting alone. Uh, Ricky Rudd, one I can think of, who had a lot of bouts back in his day. Uh, his most recent one was a, with Kevin Harvick, who got help got help got his name out there as well. So I mean, the fights do help out a lot yeah. um, with the sport. I think. The fines, I don't think the drivers care much about the fines that much because they got money. Right. Um, and a lot of times, don't you think maybe the sponsors might chip in on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sponsors are a huge thing about it. I think yeah. that's where NASCAR wants to find them at because of that. Right, absolutely. Um, but you mentioned Ricky Rudd, another guy who's not nearly as old as he is, but still a guy that's retired now is Dale Jr. And you mentioned that they're bringing back his old number? Yeah, um, I believe it is Richard Childress Racing who is bringing back the eight number. Um, not in the same style, but it's actually may run along. Uh, Daniel Hemrick will be driving that car uh, coming very soon. I believe it's actually next week, in fact, or it might be next year. I can't remember right now, top of my head. But he's done a lot. Daniel Hemrick did a lot in Truck Series with Brad Keselowski Racing. I remember him coming up through that in the Xfinity Series. He was won the Final Four uh, in the Xfinity Championship last year, nearly won that. So he's definitely got a lot of uh, a lot of accolades to his name. He's done a lot of uh, great work in NASCAR, and I think they picked a good driver for that. 
I'm sure at junior was given had given the okay on that. Sure, as well. yeah, that's something they definitely would want to want to run yeah. by him. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. with because uh, in other sports, you know, there's um, guys are known by their numbers sometimes. Oh yeah, like Kobe, for instance, number eight or maybe twenty four, mm-hmm. depending. On, and, is, you know, is that how Dale Earnhardt's gonna or Dale Junior's gonna go by as being eight or eighty eight or what do you think? I think it'll always be eight because. Around Harrison County, if you go in somewhere and it's got junior mater- um, junior stuff in it, usually it's the 8, not the 88. And usually it's always Bell Wire still associated with his name rather than Mountain Dew. Um, but I, th- I think that's always going to be there because that was his time when he got into the sport. He drove that number, I believe, in his rookie year all the way up, I believe, through – I'm not sure when, but he drove for a long while there before he moved to the 88. And, of course, I think that's the reason why they moved him to the 88 number was because they can kind of keep that number there with right. the 8. Um, but yeah, drivers are always going to be known for the numbers. Earnhardt three, Petty forty three, Junior with eight, Jeff Gordon with twenty four, Johnson forty eight. It, it'll always be like that in NASCAR. And you mentioned Richard Petty, which is a great segue into <laughs> the fact that you took a trip up to Raleigh, I believe it is, right, mm-hmm. the uh, North Carolina Museum of History. Yep. And they had some NASCAR stuff. So tell us about that. Yeah. So they have their own Hall of Fame with. Uh, all the sports in North Carolina, they even have some UNC and NC State uh, basketball jerseys. I think I started to get the UN Lance mm-hmm. on there. Um, but yeah, as soon as we walked in, the first thing that me and my sister had noticed was there was like this plaster of the wall there of like rocking him when it still said North Carolina or Speedway on it. And we just ran up to that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking, everybody knows where we're from. Right. <laughs> and even uh, at the entrance of, this, uh, of the museum, you can see in the window uh, the Earnhardt car, the Classic 3, uh, it was just out where you can see it. So we ran in there to that as well to get pictures. And they had a lot of other cool stuff in there too. They had a lot of, they actually had Richard Petty's, um, one of his fire suits there, the Earnhardt as well. They even had some video of tracks like Rockingham, uh, North Wilkesboro, and uh, Charlotte on there as well. But a lot of it was kind of just showing Rockingham. And I thought that was the coolest thing about it. Yeah. Because there's some recognition there. And when people walk in that museum, you know, thousands of people will come to that museum every single year out of state, potentially. And they're seeing our history there. And I really like that. Absolutely. And I think it's great that Richmond County is getting a little shout out up there yeah. in the Museum of History. And so. they got a lot of cool stuff with Rockingham as well up in the NASCAR Hall of Fame in Charlotte. Yes, okay. which we'll have to make a trip. Maybe maybe they'll let us film in there a little yeah. bit. We'll have to wait and see on that. But that definitely would be something to look into because uh, all we have to do is tell them we're from Rockingham. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like we're a news organization from Rockingham. <laughs> let us in and film a little bit, and uh, maybe they'll let us play with some of the stuff in there yeah. as well. That'd be cool. Uh, but uh, moving on, uh, once we come back from the break, we're, of course, going to do our Big Impacts of the Week presented by Richmond Community College and, of course, Love It or Hate It. So we will do that when we come right back with more from the RO Sports Show, of course, brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. Willow Tree Antiques and Gifts is all about rustic home decor and gifts. You will always find a variety of unique antiques, vintage, and new items in our shop. Come and see our selection of housewarming, new baby, and wedding gifts. For the man in your life, we have many collectibles, boker knives, and leather. And ladies love the jewelry, purses, candles, hats, and t-shirts. We also offer a 30-day layaway program. Come and experience shopping at Willow Tree Antiques and Gifts. You guys just outdo yourselves every day. And I really appreciate it. I honest to God don't know what I would do if it weren't for you. The things that you do, I'm in approval of. And thank you. I, 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 I don't know what else to say other than thank you. Rockingham Farm Supply, the corner of Highway 220 and Green Street in Rockingham will have their annual Customer Appreciation Day, March 23rd and 24th. Some great food and great company. Come on down. Check out the Bobcats. They are an authorized dealer for Bobcat Zero Turn Mowers. They have seed, chicks, chain, key making, a little bit of everything that you could use for your farm or your home. So come on down, enjoy some food, some fellowship, and just maybe you might get to meet Matthew and Mark. Maybe they'll give you a ride on one of the Bobcat Zero Turns.
Welcome back to the RO Sports Show brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. We're in our last segment, guys, so as we always do, we're going to do our big impacts of the week. Of course, presented by Richmond Community College, whose motto is local college, big impact. So let's start with you, Russell. Who's your big impact of the week? I've got UMBC because I think they made one of the biggest impacts on all sports in general. Uh, Of course, defeating uh, the number one overall Virginia in the first round of the tournament, first time a 60 team has ever beaten number one. Uh, so props to them and go retrievers. Yeah, it doesn't get much <laughs> but much bigger than that, does it? Jeremy, how about yourself? Uh, I want to give a shout-out to the R- Richmond um, girls softball team who had beat a Jack Britt a few days ago, 6-1. to one. Um, And the big impact is they 5-1, and one, and they 5-0 and oh in the, in conference play. So shout-out to them and keep doing what you're doing. Take us to the state championship. Yeah, the Lady Raiders <laughs> seem to have a great softball season every year for the last four or five years, yeah. so they're definitely doing a great job there. My big impact of the week – I'm going to go up to the Big Ten in a, a sport that we don't necessarily talk about uh, on this level. Uh, the Penn State Nittany Lions won the NCAA Wrestling Championship this past weekend up in uh, Cleveland at Quicken Loans Arena. The big impact being this is the seventh time they've won the championship out of eight years. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, the, kind of a, a, a dominant uh, force there that people don't really realize because nobody really follows uh, – uh, college wrestling. They're like the Alabama of wrestling. Yeah. They very much are. <laughs> Although I don't think Alabama's that successful. You <laughs> no. know? Uh, and then, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up our Richmond County Official Athletes of the Week, brought to you by McNair Auto Sales. This week, we have Hannah Millen, the senior striker from the Rady Laders soccer team, and Jonathan Lee, a senior pitcher and outfielder for the Richmond Raiders baseball team. So, of course, uh, you know, you mentioned the softball team. We want to uh, say good luck, of course, to the soccer, baseball, golf, track, uh, tennis, all the uh, Richmond Raider teams that are out there. Uh, now, let's get into my favorite segment, Love It or Hate It. And I've actually got um, a couple extra ones. Usually we try to do four or five. I think I've got five or six mm-hmm. today. Uh, but starting out with college basketball, the uh, Memphis Tigers have been looking for a head basketball coach, and they found one in the name of Penny Hardaway. So, Anybody that watched basketball in the 90s knows who Penny is, uh, and he's going to be the new coach for the Tigers. So, Russell, love it or hate it? I'm going to say love it. A successful coach coming to Memphis is going to help them out tremendously, so I'm going to say love it. Right. I love it being a first-time head coach and bring and coming back to his honorable mind to bring back to the community to coach and mentor young guys. Go for it, Penny. I love it, too, because it's going to really boost – Recruiting, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, guys are going to want to play for Penny Hardaway. I think oh, yes. just because of the experience he had in the NBA, just the stories he can tell with Big Shaq and all them, and mm. I think that'll be Ooh, great. Yes. Uh, another uh, college basketball story: Georgia University, Georgia, the Bulldogs, your favorite team, right? Uh, they've hired Tom Crean as their head coach. Of course, Tom Crean used to coach the uh, Indiana Hoosiers, um, and at that point had them in the top uh, one or two spots when he was there. Of course. Um, he had some down years. Indiana, one of those programs that if you don't do great, they can you. We saw that happen um, with Indiana with him. But now George is going to be where he ends up. What, what do you think? Love it or hate it? Well, as an Alabama fan, and, of course, Georgia will play Alabama and basketball in the SEC, I'm going to say hate it okay. because that's going to probably mean them beating us a couple of times right. next year. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I love it. Um, give him a, give him another shot to coach again, and hopefully they can, you know, Georgia can bring up their dominance in the SEC. I love it, too. I don't think there's any reason why a school like Georgia couldn't be good at basketball. You've got all the, the money, the, the facilities that you mm-hmm. need. Um, I don't think there'll be nearly as much pressure on Crean in Georgia as there was up in uh, Indiana. Sure. So I love that one as Especially well. Especially after the year that Georgia had where they actually turned down, I think, the NIT invitation. Yeah. So that will help them out, uh, maybe, maybe even make it into the next year's uh, March Madness tournament. Very well could. Cause you, as we saw this year, the SEC really improved in basketball. Yeah. So. Um, now, little, uh, we, we didn't really talk much golf this week, but I made sure to bring up Tiger here in our love it or hate it. Vegas right now has made Tiger the favorite to win the Masters. Let me start with you, Jeremy. Love I, it or hate it? I love it because I love to see Tiger back in, back in the golf game, and hopefully he'll win the Masters. Okay. I'm going to say love it because I think uh, it's really good to see Tiger back up in that talk to be winning the big games. However, I don't think he's actually going to win it. I'm not sure if he really has – that still to win it all, I think he'll finish like in the top five probably, but probably not win it. I think there's a lot of young guys who could probably beat him in it. I love it too, and if it was any other player, I, I might not because that's a lot of pressure to put on. But Tiger's been here before. This is nothing new to him. Um, I agree with you. I don't think he's going to win the Masters. 
Um, but I can see where Vegas would make him the favorite because the way Tigers played over the last two weekends, he finished second at the Valspar, which we talked about. Uh, this past week he finished fifth at Bay Hill, which is, of course, he'd already won eight times, so he knew what he was doing there. The Masters starts, uh, if not this weekend, the weekend after that, around it, it Easter. Is. So, uh, of course, we'll get into more on that. But uh, I have no problem with Vegas putting Tiger up there as the, mm-hmm. as the top pick to win in Augusta. Now, CM Punk is in the news. Of course, if you're a wrestling <laughs> fan, you know who CM Punk is. What you may not know is when he left, he went to UFC, kind of faded away it seems like, but he's hinted that he's going to make a MMA comeback at UFC 225, did, the pay-per-view. Russell Lover had a comeback. Did he even make it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I guess I'm going to say Lover just because if he's got something going on with him, great. But um, I wasn't really a fan of the way he exited out of the so I have no input on him personally but I guess I'm saying love because he's going to get something going for him right. I, I agree with Russ I love it because um, even when he was in the WWE you know all that I hated you know all that I hated about him was his cocky attitude and whatnot have you which he created a lot of enemies within the WWE then the exit out just like that but um, if you want to try, try to go kick some behind in UFC go for it I hate it because CM Punk was one of the top performers for WWE. Mm-hmm. Like you said, there was a lot of rifts between him and management. Whatever happened, yeah. he went out. I don't think you know he burnt those bridges. I don't ever see him coming back. Which I mean, he was the bread and butter for WWE. I know Chicago for, wants some beggars and to go back there. Sure, of course they do, <laughs> but it ain't their decision to make. As no. Vince's, um, I never cared that he went to UFC. I never watched his first fight or however many fights he's yeah. had. I don't really care about this. So I'm just going to say hate it because um, I just think he never should have left the, uh, the WWE no. world. Uh, now, you mentioned UNBC about to your uh, big impact of the week. They have put in the, uh, the paperwork to trademark Retrievers, Retriever Nation, and 16 over 1. Now, the reason I brought this up was you were giving UCF grief about trying to trademark and do all that national championship stuff. So what do you think? Love this or hate it? I think I'm going to say love it because they, they – Keeping that name for them, I think they should be allowed to do that, especially with with what they've been able to do, especially this past game against uh, Virginia. I think they have a right to say that, you know, hey, Mm -hmm. this is our name. Okay. We want it there. All right. What do you think? I guess I love it. Here's here's my beef with you on this. You didn't like when UCF wanted to make themselves national championships and the undefeated thing. So what's the difference between them doing that, saying we're undefeated, and UNBC taking the 16 over one trademark. Well, the thing is, they actually proved that they've they've beaten a number one team. Uh-huh. USC hasn't proved that they could win a national championship because they didn't play in it. Now, I still think they should have been in the championship, but the fact is, they weren't in it, so they can't claim it. Good answer. Uh, I love it. I, I mean, it, to me, this is kind of a fun story. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't know if they'll be able to get the Retrievers one, but I think they have a good shot at being able to trademark mm-hmm. Retriever Nation and especially sixteen over one because oh, yeah. that's the only reason mm-hmm. we're even talking about them. So I'm going to say love it. Uh, going back to golf for just a second, Rory McIlroy has suggested limiting alcohol sales during uh, during matches to curb abusive fan behavior. Apparently, they've been having some issues. Kind of like Happy Gilmore ish, where, where the fans are, are maybe drinking a little too much and getting too rowdy uh, for golf. So what Get do you think? Home. Yeah, love it or hate it. I hate it because you know, as a golfer gets prepared to hit the ball wherever it's going to the hole, they need that concentration and whatnot. Have you need you know everything's they need to be quiet in a peaceful manner, and by abuse you know alcohol users whoever do all that unnecessary noise, whatever, that could distract the golfer's um, game and could cause them to put anything can happen during that time. Sure. I, say, I, I love the fact that, that he's suggesting that they should cut back on the alcohol because, personally, I don't even like the alcohol being at the venues anyways because I think that's just a distraction, like you said. Distracting the players, get rowdy fans. and You can see it in other sports, too, when they get rowdy and they want to even fight each other because they don't like the same team or whatever. I, I think... It's just a bad idea. Limit, yeah, I think I think that's a good yeah. compromise to limit. Yeah, I'm going to agree. I'm going to say love it. And I think that there should be a limit because think about other sports. Like in baseball, they don't serve alcohol after the seventh inning. Football, they don't serve it after mm. the third quarter. They need to figure out a way. Of course, golf's structured entirely different, but they need yes. to figure out a way to, at some point, cut off alcohol sales mm-hmm. because, let's face it, golf crowds are a little more – what's the term, hoity-toity than, <laughs> than other sporting events. But still, you get alcohol in the mix, and you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. You know, you get two guys 
arguing about something. Next thing you know, you've got a fight on your hands, and that's not yeah. good. Especially those hecklers out there. What, right when they get ready to put or just even hit a drive, and then somebody just does it. Right. Where they just go, ah, or whatever, and messes it yeah, up. Of course. It's so wrong, disrespect. And that'll get you kicked out real quick. Oh, yeah. But at that point, it's already happened. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do about it. So You might just ruin that golfer's chance of winning the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. it might have been in a, in, a, in a momentum swing, and, and next thing you know, they put one in the trees. And I don't know if uh, they get to re-hit the ball or not. I don't think they do. I think I after that, it's just kind of whatever yeah. happens. Yeah. happens uh and then finally love it or hate it wwe has announced that wrestlemania is coming to new jersey next year for what will be wrestlemania 35 so jeremy love it or hate it i love it wherever the location is going to be it's going to be all right i think if you lived in new jersey or new york i think you're going to hate it because it's going to cost more congestion uh especially new jersey where it's going to be happening but i'm sure they're going to have all the parties up in new york uh doing it so i guess as a new jersey and they would probably hate it, but for me, I guess I'm gonna love it because it's kind of on the East Coast, and you're gonna have if it's in an outdoor arena, it's gonna be nighttime when it should be nighttime. Right. So I, I love that part of it. I love it too. And, and you mentioned the nighttime thing. You know, they were in San Francisco a couple of years ago, oh, yeah. and like it didn't get dark until close to the main event. Mm-hmm. You know, because and Undertaker they, had a really odd entrance yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm I'm good with it being on the East Coast as well. Uh, and, and like you, Jeremy, wherever they're gonna put it, it's gonna be huge. Um, no matter yeah. what. I just hope it don't rain. Yeah, well, see, that's the other thing you run into. Mm-hmm. Um, but I compare it to getting a Super Bowl. I mean, it's almost on that level now where Vince kind of puts it out there, like which city wants to bid on it, who wants to have yeah. all this uh, circus sometimes and festivities come with it. So this brought up a question, and we're going to end with this. I know that Charlotte has attempted to get a Super Bowl. There's some things that need to happen uh, in order to do that. But talking about WrestleMania, uh, what are the chances? What has to happen for Charlotte to get WrestleMania or a Super Bowl? What do you think? I think well, I believe I believe Charlotte could be possibly get a Super Bowl or a um, a WrestleMania spot. But in order things to do is for one, you got to have the proper management, the money, and pretty much the whole whole Carolina North and South Carolina got to have the you know the citizens got to have the support of both of both parties. Okay. Yeah, you need infrastructure to be pro- proper. You need to uh, have facilities up top notch uh, yeah. for something like Super Bowl or W to come here. And you got to have city, the city of Charlotte and the surrounding cities to be in full, uh, you know, agreement that, that yeah. this is going to happen. And also, not, men- not to mention, you got to make sure you got the facilities where they can hold a great capacity that will benefit those uh, people like W or Super Bowl. So. Can Charlotte get it? I think they can get it, but I don't know if the money's right for the other companies. I, I think it's just it matters to them more than Charlotte. And, and even with them hosting the um, All Star Game coming next year, I think it's big. That's a big plus for the Carolinas, mm-hmm. and which I in the history of the NBA, I don't never, I don't know if Charlotte ever hosted an All Star Weekend. But at in the end of the day is. We'll see what happens with this, you know, how well Charlotte does with this All Star game. If it mm-hmm. you know, if it goes well for them, it could probably open up more avenues for down the road for Super Bowls, WWE or any other big time. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think they if, if I'm not sure how far down the road it will be from when the women will have the main event of WrestleMania, but if they were to do that, I think having it in Charlotte would be the best place and having Charlotte Flair winning sure. the Women's Championship. Yeah. I think be oh, great, yeah. That would definitely have to be on the menu if they end I think up we in the should Queen be City. A, uh, the call auditorium to get WrestleMania out here. Give, yeah. give, who? <laughs> call gonna, auditorium. They're going to fight in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 uh, we love the Cole and oh, RCC, yeah. Yeah. obviously, but I don't think they're no. a big enough yeah. venue for that. Uh, but just real quick, you mentioned the All Star game. They do have Time Warner, or actually Spectrum Arena now yes. mm-hmm. there. The Panther Stadium, Bank of America. Right now, I don't think it's um, compatible enough to have a Super Bowl. No. I know that the city has said that they would have to put money into it to get it up to standards that the NFL would want. That's going to cost a lot of money. And yeah. people want the city to pay for that. Exactly. And I think it may have to come to a scenario many years down the road where they have to tear that stadium down and build something brand new before mm-hmm. they even sniff a Super Bowl yeah. or a WrestleMania. <clears throat> and real quick, you mentioned another place, not in North Carolina, but South Carolina, that they could think about. I think they should probably build a stadium for something like Super Bowl or WWE to come to for WrestleMania in Myrtle Beach. Because I think Ooh. having it on the coast, uh, will be really great. I yeah, think it'll, it'll be, be real nice. Merle Beach and the surrounding area. Everybody loves Merle Beach around here. I think it'll be a great uh, venue for that. 
Well, you heard it right here, at WWE. Uh, if you're listening, Vince, move it to Myrtle Beach. I know I'll go down to it because we. Got I my, would. My family's got a place down there. Yeah. I would love that. I'll get a room for that one. And you get everybody up and down the eastern seaboard that want to come down to it. Imagine a pirate themed uh, WrestleMania, perhaps, because ECU is that road. That's where uh, I think that's where Vince McMahon had graduated from. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I know he was born in Pinehurst. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't. I mean, Carolina. I'm surprised we haven't had WrestleMania here because yeah. of that reason. Yeah, yeah. North Carolina is uh, growing very fastly. So. Um, you know, maybe in, in a decade or so, yeah. we'll be sitting here talking about the, the Super Bowl or WrestleMania coming to the Carolinas. But uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the RO Sports Show. Of course, brought to you by First Health Orthopedics. We'll be right back here next week, same time, Thursday night at 5.30. And uh, we're going to be continuing our, our coverage on March Madness. At that point, like I said earlier, we'll be in the Final Four. We're also going to get into some baseball with opening day right around the corner. <clears throat> All that and much more next week. Of course, you can watch us on the RO's uh, YouTube page, the Richmond Observer app, the Richmond Observer Facebook page. You can listen to us on the Classic Rock, and of course, it's all free, so can't beat that. Uh, so once again, we'll see you right here next week, Thursday at 5.30. Thanks for watching. <laughs>